So I said, well, why then are you, you know, supporting a carnival diet? And he said, well, we've got anecdotes. We've got... <laughs> a- anecdotes. We're collecting explain anecdotes. What an, explain what an anecdote is for someone who's listening who might not... An anecdote is the equivalent of a story. Mm-hmm. So normally, if you look at the dictionary definition of anecdote, it's an amusing story. Mm-hmm. So the difference between an anecdote and science is it's the difference between collecting data under controlled conditions from thousands of people and potentially carrying that study on in a longitudinal fashion for many years so you can get like you can track people's health outcomes Mm -hmm. and asking someone on the train how they're feeling that's the difference between an anecdote and saying you know oh yeah i feel like this today and a scientific study that has got thousands of people thousands and thousands of data points and statistics to and it's been peer reviewed and published in mm-hmm. prestigious journals yeah. are supporting the you know, plant based lifestyle so so that's the best avail- available evidence we have on nutrition is these big population big studies. studies yeah so they're like a cohort study where they yeah. they either go backwards in time and track yeah. people or they Follow they them. follow them. Yeah. Because um, a lot of people might not understand research and how it's collected and how statistics are collected and how, you know, they find these differences in health outcomes. Yeah. Can you explain, like, what a cohort is and how, like, let's just say um, the Adventist study, how they would mm. do something like that? Okay. So what they might do is take a cohort, so a, a, a group of people, a large group of people, and they might want to, let's say, for example, look at colon cancer as one of their potential outcomes. So at baseline, they'll take a lot of data. So they'll they'll get medical evidence from records. So they'll make sure that nobody at baseline has got colon cancer. Okay. They'll take measures to do with the current diet and things like that. So that's one of the criticisms of these cohort studies that some of them have only looked at what diet people are on once. And then once they start following them for years, well, people might change their diet. So that's an obvious criticism, but there are some studies that have actually consistently, consistently um, tested diet and mm-hmm. got people to do not just one a one questionnaire, but food diaries and things like that. So no, it's not perfect, but it's the best we can do yeah. whilst being ethical. What and do you mean by that being ethical? Because being you ethical. can't lock people in the exactly. room and do a exactly yeah do exactly. like an RCT. <laughs> Exactly. You can't take people out of their everyday life, say, right, you guys don't have colon cancer. You guys don't have colon cancer either. So we're going, now going to lock you up for 10 years. And give and, one of you colon cancer but through diet. And we're going to force feed <laughs> mm. um, half of you a carnivore diet yep. and force feed half of you a plant-based diet. Mm. Well, you can't do that. It's unethical. So, so the next best thing is to track people through their daily lives take measures of what they're eating mm-hmm. and um, th- th- other th- they also take into account things like alcohol use, smoking. Exercise. And- exercise, yeah. Um, other other health poss- possibilities. Social that- sort of setting or... Didn't Sometimes. The, didn't the Aventus study account for the most variables? Uh, well, it, a it, lot. Was, it was a very comprehensive study, mm-hmm. yeah. So the more comprehensive a study is, the more well planned it is, the more variables that you can account for throughout the entire study, yeah. then the less limitations that study has. Okay. So there's no one perfect study. Every single study that's ever been published in any field whatsoever, not just nutrition or psychology or biology, but physics and chemistry, all of it, there's always going to be limitations. And that's why when authors write up papers, they always have a section in the discussion addressing the limitations okay. and then suggesting uh, future ideas for research, how, how such limitations might be overcome in the future. Okay. So in terms of cohort studies, what if it was just one, one cohort study that had ever been done and that was it, mm-hmm. on one population, one sample, say the Adventist study, and they'd collected it you know, over a few years and it was just one, I wouldn't be convinced by it. The thing that convinces me is although these studies have their limitations, what they are doing is collecting data from many different parts of the world different types of people asking different types of questions using using statistical methods that are the most robust 
that they possibly can be. So taking taking into account lots of uh, possible confounding variables. Yes. And the data comes together as a consistent body of research. The other thing about scientific research is that um, if you, you find what we call converging lines of evidence, mm -hmm. so we've got the cohort studies like the epidemiological uh, data, data sets, but we've also got more mechanistic data. We've also got, however cruel they might be, we've also got animal studies. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can look at models of how things might, might be playing out in the body. Yeah, mechanistic data, just explain mechanistic to people. Mechanistic data is how something works. Yeah. So because you can't you can't look inside the body, you can't look inside the body, what you've kind of got to do is, again, it's about compromise mm -hmm. because you can't rip people open to no. look at their insight. It's unethical to do that. So there's other ways you can do it. You can do in vitro studies, which are in the test tube. You can, you can develop animal models and look, at, uh, and look at animals. But mechanistic data is just how something works and tracking, like putting together a model. Sometimes it's theoretical because sometimes you don't have all the evidence. But you, like, like, for example, the role of cholesterol in atherosclerosis. Yes. Um, that's a, a big thing that the, the carnists are denying at the moment. And they say that, you know, we, we should only look at the mechanistic data. But we know how atherosclerosis develops. And we know that LDL has got a role in that development. It's not the sole cause, but we know from converging lines of evidence through many years of different studies... Yeah. So how can that be denied? So the con overall, in terms of nutrition, what, we, what we've got at the moment, and we can pick studies apart, we can look at the different flaws in individual studies, but because we've got, we've got replicative findings, we've got different populations, different locations, different time points, looking at a variety of different like illness outcomes, you know, cancer, heart disease, strokes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then we've got the mechanistic side. We have got some randomised control trials. They tend to be small scale. They tend to be again flawed, but putting the body of evidence together, all of it together, what we can say is, <laughs> eating meat is one of the worst things you can do. Wow. For your health. So you're saying all of these collectively are pointing to the same thing. They're collecting. So they're all they, supporting yeah. part, bits of data. Yeah. And then they do something like it's a, a meta-analysis where they analyze a group of a large group of yeah. like a few hundred studies yeah. and yeah. see if there's anything consistent. Yeah. So what they do in meta-analysis is they they start off with what we call a systematic review of the literature. Okay. So they they, they might want to look at all the different studies that have been um, done on colon cancer and meat, for example, mm -hmm. right? So they systematically review the literature, they make sure they don't miss anything. And then if they have um, enough studies that have used broadly the same measures, then they can do a meta-analysis. So as well as the systematic review, which is a systematic review of the literature, mm -hmm. they do a meta-analysis, which is a statistical technique which looks at the magnitude of the effect overall. So it pulls the data from all of those different studies and it looks at the effect sizes and how strong the effects are. So meta-analyses are, are considered the pinnacle of the hierarchy of evidence, the scientific hierarchy of evidence. Again, the hierarchy is something that the carnists deny. And I've, I've done a video on the, the hierarchy of evidence and I, I'll readily admit that just because it's a meta-analysis doesn't mean it's good. Okay. Because there are some terrible meta-analyses out there. Um, it might be that the research area doesn't lend itself terribly well to meta-analyses because the, the measures aren't really very consistent. Would, would you say that the worst meta-analysis is better than the best anecdote in terms of evidence? Oh, without, without <laughs> a shadow of a doubt. Uh, the, the anecdotes don't even make it on, on to the hierarchy of evidence because they're not science. They're just not science. No. They're, they're just having a conversation. You could say anything and exactly. that would be considered evidence. Exactly.